over time. I think basically it's about strategy in the beginning and small steps and then just providing a process so that the take up is gradual so people can see actually that there's a, a process that you can use so it's not so overwhelming. That's just one little comment. Yeah, uh, I'd like to second that comment. Uh, my name's Henry, I work at the Department of Immigration and Citizenship and uh, last year we set up a blog on GovSpace and uh, it's taken a year for it to even sort of begin to, for other people outside of the initial core group of people to start writing posts and thinking about stuff to say. And even then, we're still struggling really to embed it in people's everyday processes. It's easy to get people to write min reps. It's not easy for them to write book blog posts, especially in the language and, and that type of stuff that we're looking for. Uh, but I would agree that it's a step-by-step -step process and it's really gonna take some time. Uh, so don't get discouraged at the start because uh, you might uh, give up before it's too soon, so. Any other comments? Hi, um, my name is Rebecca, I work at the tax office and I was just um, thinking about your comment about some of the sort of back-end technologies or the less sexy ones and I sort of work in a sort of area that's looking at doing a bunch of things with metadata and of course you never get a metadata project up as a metadata project so um, we, we've been thinking along the same lines around um, choosing the strategy and thinking about um, benefits mapping, so what is it that, that it indirectly um, might achieve for or enable um, in terms of other projects that might have more direct benefits um, to push that mapping through and then also not to, not to undertake the project without the, the people and the process arms of that as well, so thinking about the policy all the way down through to the process steps that people um, need to follow and influencing the organisation's information culture um, to actually get it working. There's one down the front, of course. You're going to go from front to back, aren't you? <coughs> um, know why you're doing what it is that you're doing, um, not just doing. I'm, I'm a programmer, so a lot of the things that I want to do are because I like doing it. Um, and that's not, that doesn't mean I shouldn't be doing it, um, but I, I might be doing that for a self-development purpose or because I enjoy doing it. And the end product is not useful, or not necessarily, uh, it's not, you're not going to sustain it because it doesn't have a purpose for existing. If you can't answer why it is that you've built what it is you're building, not don't do it because it may still be useful for your own self. If, you, if it is something for yourself, bring someone along with you because then you've doubled its worth. Um, but if, if you know what it is and, and you can answer solidly why, then it will live on because it exists for a purpose. I should probably also say I'm, I'm from Geoscience Australia and my background is in the back-end uh, storage infrastructure. So we see a lot of projects that are being developed for various very good purposes, but we kind of find out about it late in the piece. So early in today they were talking about having champions um, and I assume that flows through to how an, an organisation's leadership structure works. But um, I guess maybe when you are innovating, think about the impacts that the work that you're doing may have on the people that are supporting you, and as well as trying to cultivate the, the upward um, champion role in your organisation, maybe also think about how you can engage with the other people that are going to support you to get there. pick out of there is sustainable and the biggest enemy to the public service, to innovation, to anything is time. The biggest killer of sustainable projects and sustainable systems is mob change. We have a change of government, we have different departments, people leave, people come, uh, responsibility for something goes. So until we have a way to have those systems outside of our actual silos as portfolios, um, we're always going to be struggling. I, I might just throw a comment in. It's no concession. I think I'm allowed to do that. Um, the, it's, something, it's certainly something I've noticed as well. The tech people are very rarely engaged in the conversation. 
And on one end, there's fear of engaging them because they will say no. Um, on the other end, by not engaging, um, what you end, the ideas you come up with, if you have the resources in-house to run them, then fine, they'll run for a year or two, then they'll fall over when that person leaves or that person runs out of enthusiasm. Um, but, so at the same time, we, we, both, we need both. We need to be appreciating the fact that we need to have IT and tech people and people on the bleeding edge of technology, which underpins everything now. So if you don't have those people engaged, you're going to fail and you're not going to be able to take advantage of new stuff um, in your business development, um, strategic development. Um, but at the same time, we need a change in culture on the other side of um, IT departments that, um, that they need to be better supported, but they also need to be more comfortable to take risks. So maybe splitting out sort of projects from um, management might be a good way, because at the moment, most IT departments, and I've worked in them myself, spend 100% of the time, 150% of the time firefighting and, and don't even have the capacity to do anything beyond that. So we need more support on both sides and more engagement on both sides. What do you reckon about that? Yeah, and that you've just... Um Reminded me of something that one of our scientists had mentioned about how things used to work maybe 20 odd years ago, where they used to take people from the science teams and bring them into um, more of an IT role. So maybe innovation is about bringing people together from the edges of different technologies so that they can feed off each other and, and you've got that, the different domains involved from the start. We're um, experiencing something that sounds quite similar at the Department of Broadband, just with a new information management system. And there's a couple of things that I'm hearing that sound very similar in that we're finding one of our biggest um, challenges is actually getting the higher-ups to use this stuff so that we feel we have to. Because moving from area to area, I find that anywhere where our AS or above doesn't use the technology, or ask why it's not being used if we present something outside of it, we sort of go, oh, well, it doesn't matter then, and take a lot of lead from that. Whether that's right or not is another thing entirely, but it seems to have become the culture. Yeah. Um, similarly, things that communicate well within our internal communication structure, or even breaking out of it in useful ways, like our internal structure doesn't support postering the entire place, but occasionally we'll do it anyway. Um, seem to really grab people's attention and worm their way into the mentality, whereas anything that just doesn't show up on our intranet, um, doesn't turn up in our branch meeting discussions and that sort of thing, um, it just doesn't rate a thought, even if we're doing something that's very relevant to it. So I wonder if... I mean, that's obviously part of your culture change, but I think maybe it's something we need to focus on when we're innovating to work our way into that mentality. We have a few more minutes of this session. Um, look, I'm not with an agency. Uh, I mean, with a cloud organisation. I think um, there's some interesting comments that came out earlier on, on the uh, uh, presentation on the stage. And I guess in terms of innovation and failing uh, early and things like that, uh, perhaps even using some of those resources which don't touch BAU and all of the uh, change management, which is so typical with, with agencies and it's so difficult to get those resources to be able to very quickly be able to set up um, user uh, external capability. I realise that's not for everyone, but basically being able to get something up, uh, proof of concept and get it out. We had a fantastic two days here over the weekend and looking at the amount of innovation that came out in 48 hours was just phenomenal. And yet, you know, some of those things are probably even far sexier, far uh, more brilliant than some of the systems which are actually production systems in agencies today and yet they are turned out in 48 hours. So um, I think there's a lot to learn from this and using those external resources. Engagement with the public. There is a lot to be said for it. Hold on. Thanks, Priya. Chris Sampson from Future Earth Systems. I think uh, just echoing that point and the point that uh, the lady made earlier, Really, I get the feeling that we're on a kind of a iterative journey and uh, probably need to try and bear in mind to always think of the end outcome. You know, what is it that we're trying to improve? How is that this going to make you know, citizens' um, services better? And then um, understand that I think in our government organisations we need to build sort of sustainable capacity and capability 
to embark on an iterative journey where we continuously work on improving our systems and testing them against the outcomes. And I think um, my experience is that these things kind of get lost in the momentum of large projects um, and quite often good ideas also get lost along the way because um, you know, people are just caught up in the, in the government mechanisms. I'll throw another comment in. Um, the, I think that those three pillars of open government that you've said, some of you have heard me rabbit on about before fit quite nicely into this, the open data, public engagement and citizen-centric services. If everything that we did in the public service um, built around those three premises, in particular the citizen-centric services, then we wouldn't be focused on well, how do we make our department look good, we'd be look, focused on well, how do we make sure that the citizen's getting what they want regardless of which department it comes from. So. There's a lot of barriers to get to cross, but as long as we're all rocking, then we should get there. We've just got another time for one more question. Any or comment, please? Um, I guess if we're talking about sustainable systems, um, I think what, uh, what we are saying in the Office of Spatial Policy from a spatial perspective is that uh, whatever we develop needs to be standards-based so that it can be technology agnostic. Um, and that's the way that we can then implement these really good ideas that come out of things like, uh, like GovHack. Um, notoriously, as I said this morning, what we do is independently we develop uh, data, data supplies and systems um, that can't speak to each other um, and can't interact. So we've got to somehow get over that. Any last? Oh, there was. There we go. It was a nose touch leading to a question, uh, a comment. Thank you. Thanks. Um, some of the comments have just made me sort of think about an idea. So um, at Tax, we have a, a logical data model um, at an enterprise level, and it helps keep the um, uh, that common thread through the technology changes. So we'll physically implement it through changing software, changing technologies. Um, but our enterprise logical data model helps us to define what that data means to us and how we use it um, to operate our organisation day to day. Um, but wouldn't it be great if we had a whole of government logical data model to accompany the standards um, so that um, we know how we're actually enforcing them and, um, and we get that interoperability up? Yep. Thank you.